of this violence in Nigeria. What, why, and the way forward? When we put it like that, it feels like quite easily done. We put it in mathematical pressure calculation. You run us through the backgrounds to this. Now, very recently, something alarming happened in Nigeria. It was reported by Punch on March 25th, 2023, where Justice Raman Oshidi of the Legal Sexual Offenses at Domestic Violence Court convicted the founder of Optimal Cancer Foundation, Samuel Lale, filing his wife's 16 year old niece. And the imperative to address this violence against women comes into sharper focus. For so many who have discussed this after them, almost as though we've not had a conglomeration of voices on such issues as sexual and gender-based violence until then. Now, this case is not isolated. It's emblematic of a pervasive issue that demands urgent attention. The judge's verdict affirming the charges of defilement and sexual assault penetration underscores the harsh reality faced by many women and girls in Nigeria. Now, when you look at the concept of violence against women and girls, you realize that it is deeply entrenched and it is a multifaceted challenge and it transcends geography, culture, socioeconomy, and the United Nations a particular report of theirs says that one in three women globally experiences physical or sexual violence in her lifetime. I think this is truly alarming and it may actually help us have a sense of what we're truly to do here today. Now, the urgency to address violence against women and girls as a global emergency has been underscored by our United Nations release. And that's UNITE campaign, which started in 2022. Interestingly, this year as well, we find that the theme for the International Day of the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Girls, which is observed every year on, the November, on November 25th, which is actually the first day of the 16 days of activism, which peaks every year on the 10th of December, is UNITE. And I think this is really amazing. Unite, invest, prevent violence against women and girls. All right. And that way is my way of saying you are welcome. It was a great way of introducing what we have coming on for everyone joining, understanding that this is going to be a robust moment of welcoming you and discussing issues of gender-based violence. That said, I'd like to quickly introduce the Punch Media Foundation team to quickly take us through introductions. Morning. Good morning, uh, esteemed guests and speakers. The Board of Trustees of Punch Media Foundation Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to another edition of the PUNCH webinar series, a program dedicated to marking select UN International Days towards addressing issues that affect development. Today marks the 14th day of the annual global 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, and we are all here, not just to join in the campaign, but to actively chart our course to development as we raise awareness and understanding of gender-based violence issues, empower survivors and victims, influence positive media reporting, enhance legal knowledge and access to justice, and challenge gender discriminatory norms, among others. Our speakers are pregnant with the passion and ideas to make this happen. And of course, with the support of everyone on this call. As I close, permit me to share with you 
impact what we found in a survey we recently conducted, which revealed that many people in our society are not aware of the legal provisions that safeguard the rights of women and girls in cases of violence. This is quite disturbing to know. But I trust that our speakers will do justice to this and other important issues that relate to our focus today. Once again, thank you for joining and do have a very great time. Over to you, moderator. Thank you so much, Punch Media Foundation team. And please permit me to say this, that this webinar series, the Punch webinar series is organized by Punch Media Foundation. And that was such a warm introduction given by an official of the Punch Media Foundation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished you, you know yourselves, I cannot mention everybody's name. May I please bid you welcome once again to this Punch webinar series where we talk the gender and gender-based violence in Nigeria, the what, why, and way forward. I'd like to very quickly go into the introduction of guests. And to do this, I'd like for you to pay what I would call keen attention, because this indeed would form the very foundation of how you understand our speakers and panelists. I begin with Dr. Abiola Akiode Afolabi. She is a development expert with over 25 years of experience in legal practice. Abiola Akiode Afolabi teaches human rights, law and civil liberties, constitutional law, gender and the law at the Faculty of Law, University of Lagos. She holds a PhD from the University of London in gender and international humanitarian law. And among several awards that she has won, I'd just like to mention a few that are quite notable. The 1999 UN Defenders Award, the 2019 US Embassy Orange Award, the 2020 National Human Rights International Women's Day Award, the 100 Women Role Model Awards, 2021 and 2022 University of Michigan, Visiting Scholar Activist Award. And I would expect some round of applause. Now, very quickly, I move to Benjamin Hundeni, and I have to quickly confirm or confess that I have to learn to pronounce this name. And I am hoping when I'm able to hear from him, he's able to say that I did a good job. Now, uh, we'll very quickly take Benjamin Odeni, who was one time PPRO at the Zone 2 Command Headquarters, Unicorn Lagos, and was a member of the Nigerian contingent to the United Nations Peacekeeping Mission in the Four Sudan in 2020. And Odeni holds a BA Honors in English Language from the Lagos State University and MSc in Legal Criminology and Security Psychology from the University of Ibadan. Very quickly, is an associate of the Nigerian Institute of Public Relations, NIPR, member of the International Public Relations Association, IPRA, and an associate of the Chartered Institute of Personal Management of Nigeria, CIPM. And on that note, I'd like to take a breather of introducing our speakers for a moment. I will very quickly go to take the keynote address and to take us into the keynote address is none other than Mrs. Bimbo Oloyede. Now, the, Mrs. Bimbo Oloyede, very quickly, is currently the CEO lead consultant, at strictly speaking. She's an author, trainer, and has been a broadcast professional for almost five decades. And if you look at her history, I think for me it's quite interesting how she was employed by NBC. TV, I'm sure so many of us do not even know what this is at this time, as an assistant producer in 1975. And I quickly would like to talk to what she has done, especially the Women's Home Development Foundation with Beth, from 2000 and to 2015, partnered with UNFPA, UN Women, UNICEF, UNDP, and Family 
Okay, please. All right, thank you so much. I understand there was a bit of a glitch with my audio for a bit. I do not know how far along that was, but at this juncture, I would like to quickly acknowledge the presence of the Chapman Punch Nigeria Limited, and that is in person of Mrs. Angela Emua. And I would also very quickly like to recognize the presence of my MD, the Managing Director, Punch, Nigeria Limited, and that's equally in person of Mr. Adeye Joseph. That said, I was done introducing to ask the keynote speaker in person of Mrs. Bimbo Oloyede. I do not know if that was uh, beautifully and dutifully taken, and I would like to yield the floor over so that Mrs. Bimbo Oloyede can take us to the keynote speech, and that speaks very well to our topic, just talking on gender-based violence in Nigeria, the what, why, and the way forward. Thank you very much. Uh, just trying to uh, share my screen. All right, can you see the screen clearly and can you hear me clearly? Yes, please, yes, we can. Right. Thank you very much. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, we're all here because we are stakeholders in gender-based violence in Nigeria. And we're also here to talk about the what, why, and way forward. Well, let's begin with Nigeria a country of approximately 924,000 square kilometers, capital Abuja, official language English, money Naira. We have a population of 200 million plus. And in this population, we have an issue, a big one, because we are told that physical or sexual violence is experienced by one in three women. Sometimes when we hear that sentence, we don't actually know exactly what it means. So let me give you a little bit of insight. Let's assume that we have a population of 200 million plus. Let's also assume that 100 million are men and 100 million are women. So if we have one in three women adversely affected by physical and sexual violence, we're actually talking about 33 million women. So let's again assume that 66 million women are okay, but 33 million women have a problem. Now, going back to our map of Nigeria, what does that actually mean? Let's take it a step further. If you look at the map, you can see that it's divided into various states. So that 33 million means, according to this map, that everybody in Yobe, I'm assuming that they're all women, Yobe, Borno, Adamawa, Taraba, and Gombe states, all the women, everybody in that in those states, they are all adversely affected. And then we have crept in to Bauchi, we have crept into Plateau, and we're also well on our way into Benue State. That, to me, is a very alarming situation. So let's find out what is gender-based violence. Well, it's a serious violation of human rights, and it covers harmful acts that are perpetrated against a person's will based on their gender. Its consequences are devastating, 
and often affects victims physically, psychologically, economically, or socially. But how was it coined? Where did this phrase, this term, gender-based violence, come from? It actually emerged in 1993 during the Vienna Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women. GBV was defined then as, and I quote, violence that is directed against a woman because she is a woman or that affects women disproportionately. Directed against a woman because she is a woman or that affects women disproportionately. You might say, what about the boys? Well, you would be right to ask what about the boys because some believe that GBV does not adequately address violence against men and boys. But the point here is that whether it's violence against women or violence against boys, there is a consensus. GBV is not personal. It is a systemic canker worm. It requires stronger action. It not, must be prevented. It must be addressed. And of course, it must be stopped. Because you see, GBV is pervasive. It's anywhere. It's in homes, schools, offices, communities. In fact, it's everywhere. It's in motor parks, factories, bus stops, laybys, you name it. And then anybody can be a perpetrator. Could be your relative, a doctor, a lecturer, a stranger, or even a figure in authority. It could be your driver, your nanny, a gate man, your father, your uncle or friend, which makes it really dangerous. Not just dangerous, but insidious because it's faceless. It's not written on anybody's face. So you don't know when it's coming towards you. You don't know when it's going to hit you. It's shapeless. You don't know if the person is big or small or fat or thin or tall or short, borderless. Which country? Which community, which village, which continent, any of them? Colorless, the person could be black, could be white, could be Asian, colorless. And then of course, also ageless. It could be 80, the perpetrator could be 80 or 18 or 38 or 58. It is just something that has to be roundly condemned. And the late Kofi Annan condemned it in very clear terms. He said, violence against women is perhaps the most shameful human rights violation, and it is perhaps the most pervasive. It knows no boundaries of geography, culture, or wealth. As long as it continues, we cannot claim to be making real progress towards equality, development, and peace. So at this point, let's ask ourselves, what are the types of gender-based violence? Well, there's physical violence, hitting, slapping, kicking, whipping, biting, choking, all of those physical violence. Then there's economic violence. We have modern day slavery. We have women that are suffering every day in forced labor. Some of them young, some of them old, some of the young ones hawking on the streets in dangerous traffic jams. And then you have also women in rural areas, no access to land, no resources. So economic violence. Then we have emotional violence. So women are subjected to verbal abuse, threats, intimidation, emotional distress, if you like. And of course, there's sexual violence. Acts like rape, sexual assault, harassment, even marital rape. Then perhaps the worst type, or at least it is this type that encompasses everything, every type of violence, be it emotional or physical or sexual or economic, or psychological, human trafficking covers it all. In fact, Samantha Power, 
of USAID said that violence against women isn't cultural, it is criminal. Equality cannot come eventually. It is something that we must fight for now. So why does GBV exist? Well, I think there are many reasons, but I'm going to talk about four. I'm going to talk about history, culture, poverty, and ignorance. When it comes to history, it is replete with examples of GBV. Women were often seen as chattels, and of course, domestic abuse was prevalent. Across ancient civilizations, the Romans, the Greeks, other cultures and societies, sexual violence was used to control women's bodies. Physical and psychological harm, of course, were regularly inflicted, and sometimes entire communities were undermined. For centuries, GBV was both a consequence of war as well as a tactic of war. In fact, women became weapons of war. Sometimes women and children were terrorized and in some instances, whole populations were conquered. When we got to the Middle Ages, I'm afraid women fared no better. The excuse this time was religious doctrines and societal restrictions. Of course, there were so many environmental opportunities for GBV. By the middle of the 19th century, the feminist movement emerged and so did racial agitations. So did political agitations for that matter. So patri patriarchal norms were challenged. Advocacy for women's rights began in earnest in America as well as in the UK. And then racial agitations began. Ruth Sojourner wrote her famous poem, Ain't I a Woman? By the time we got to the 20th century, international declarations and conventions emerged. We had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We had the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which we know as CEDAW. There was the Beijing Platform for Action in 1995. And in 2000, the United Nations Security Council adopted Resolution 1325. This was supposed to give women more opportunities to participate in peace processes and political institutions so that the uh, incidences of insecurity and GBV could be reduced. So far in the 21st century, more legal frameworks have been established to combat GBV. In 2008, the United Nations Secretary General launched a special campaign, Unite to End Violence Against Women, which happens to run parallel to the 16 days of activism. But despite these advances, advancements, GBV still persists locally. So let's look at poverty. Now, here are some probable scenarios. You have husbands or male figures who control resources, such that women have much less access to money and other resources. You have situations where women are working against their will. They are forced to accept menial and laborious jobs. No choice. In fact, there are also women who choose to accept domestic abuse. They're, af they're, they're afraid of the unknown. Where will they get food? Where will they be safe? Where will they have shelter? And then of course, poverty reduces opportunities. Poor access to education, healthcare, and employment. And we have a situation too, brought about by culture and religion, where we have women who are secluded and closeted. So naturally, they don't get very much information. They will not have relevant knowledge. And so naturally too, aid will be remote. Where will they get help? So when we move to culture, here, patriarchy conveniently reigns supreme. Men traditionally hold positions of power and authority. There's this concept of ownership. Wives are bought, 
even in-laws can inherit widows. Male dominance and female subordination is a message that has been passed across for so long. It, there are romantic images showing the powerful man and the weak woman. Then we have continued child marriage. Girls are exposed to sexual abuse, health risks, and of course, domestic violence. Not to talk of female genital mutilation, which is a gateway to birth complications and intimacy challenges. Then there's ignorance. <sighs> they say that um, what you don't know will not harm you. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I do know that some women don't know that they are being abused. How would they know? They've grown up, they've been socialized in family lives that have made them become party to abuse. Then in situations of conflict and insecurity, you have displacement, you have disruption, hotbed of sexual violence and exploitation. And where would they go to for help? Rescue opportunities are also largely unknown. Victims don't know where to get help, especially in rural communities. Then we also have, as actually has been mentioned earlier, ignorance of existing laws and agencies. There are laws against GBV, but they are often poorly enforced. And even for those people who are aware of these laws, they reject, they reject them. They reject existing legal frameworks because they are subject to family pressures and they are persuaded to settle out of court. The last aspect of ignorance is that we find situations where danger is lurking in all sorts of unexpected places. We have wolves in sheep's clothing. They are in churches, they are in mosques, they are in institutions of learning, they are in offices, they are everywhere. So why does GBV exist? Well, I've mentioned history, but that history has given rise to entitlement. The women feel that the men are entitled. The men already believed that they were entitled. Then poverty. What does poverty lend us towards? Women being, I'm not sure of, of, of the right word. Is it bombarded? Is it uh, uh, bullied into silence? Then we have culture and culture just creates situations where women, they give up, they submit, they acquiesce. And of course, ignorance. Well, if you don't know, how would you even care? Of course, you become indifferent. So where are we now? Well, since 1991, civil society organizations have been commemorating the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. It's an annual international campaign was started by activists at the inauguration of the Women's Global Leadership Institute. And as you heard earlier, it kicks off on the 25th of November, which is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And it runs until the 10th of December, which is Human Rights Day. Where are we right now? Day 13. Day 13 of the 16 days of activism. And let me use this opportunity to give kudos, to congratulate the Punch Media Foundation for putting this forum together. The more opportunities we have like this, the better. But disturbing facts are with us. Disturbing facts have emerged since resolution 1325. We've had several conferences and summits. We've had several reports, follow-up reports, case studies, shadow reports. I could go on and on. But the bottom line 
is that non-state actors bemoan government's lukewarm stance. Rape incidences keep escalating in Nigeria. Political representation is at its lowest ebb. And so why wouldn't we have a situation where men are still deciding the fate of the majority of women? It's largely due to political represent representation being at its lowest ebb. Women just don't seem to get a look in. So that brings me back to our map of Nigeria and what is the way forward for Nigeria. Again, let's look at our map. Let's look at our numbers. Let's look at the 33 million plus women on the right-hand side of Nigeria who have been subjected to physical and sexual violence. Some years ago, Hillary Clinton said that it's time that we move forward from good words to good works, from sound bites to sound solutions. You can see that I highlighted we, works, and solutions, because if we don't combine those three, we're not moving anywhere. And so here's our population. Here's our map again of Nigeria. What's our ultimate aim? Well, we can end it. We can try to end it. We can try to curb it. I want to use the word delete because it has a, a, a much more final picture in my mind. Delete GBV in Nigeria. And by so doing, we will be living up to expectations of the SDGs 3, and five by 2030. But it is going to take a concerted effort. We are all going to have to dig in to this issue. We will have to promote political and legal will nationwide. It can't be done in bits and pieces and in pockets. It has to be a concerted effort. That means we must sustain reportage across the nation because it is imperative that we raise the bar of understanding. And raising that bar of understanding also means that we must get male support. Well, if we want to talk to the men, if we want to get them on our side, we're going to have to think of some creative solutions, some creative approaches, some creative campaigns. And so we must promote creativity, so that at the end of the day, what we're doing is increasing awareness all around. Once awareness is increased, I believe that action will also take place. So as I close, let me remind you about what Archbishop Desmond Tutu said. He was talking to the men. It is by standing up for the rights of girls and women that we truly measure up as men. And then Muhammad Ali Jinnah, founder of Pakistan, said this, no struggle can ever succeed without women participating side by side with men. There are two powers in this world. One is the sword, the other is the pen. And there is great rivalry between the two. However, there is a third power that is stronger than both that of women. I rest my case. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. I paid rapt attention and I can bet that wasn't just me. Everyone who listened to you speak today paid rapt attention. This was beautifully put together, well-researched, and it was presented in such a manner that it puts the woman at the very center of it. And I saw myself there in so many ways. And somebody would say, for women who are educated, those of us who may, let's put it, be uh, lucky. Let's throw in the word luck. Lucky mm -hmm. enough to be educated, lucky enough, you know, to write about certain social, um, possibly um, barriers in the society, that it is luck and we shouldn't be there. But then if I'm looking at how 
gender-based violence isn't just physical, it is equally non-physical. And according to you, how ignorance equally comes to play, then that puts every woman at the center of that. Thank you so much for that very detailed presentation. And that, again, I would underscore, has set the right tone and foundation for the conversation that we are having here today. I'd like to very quickly make welcome everyone that has joined today. We are holding this because we believe indeed that you believe that we have something really key and important to share. And this is the time to equally acknowledge the presence of the general manager, digital and publications, Punch Newspapers, as well as the editor, The Punch, the deputy editor, Weekend Titles, the editor, Weekend Titles, and the editor, Punch Online, as well as several of our managers that have joined as well from Punch Newspapers and Punch Nigeria Limited. And so I'd like to take it further from where I took a breather, talking about introducing everyone to the speakers that we have here present. And I indeed introduced Dr. Abiola Kyodia Falabi earlier. I equally introduced Benjamin Ondei, and I introduced Mrs. Bimbo Olo Kide. I'd very quickly like to go to Dr. Samuel Alade Jari, who is a medical doctor, psychiatrist, project manager, and an author. He's a passionate, he is passionate, beg your pardon, about human rights and improving the lives of people around him through volunteering, advocacy, and service. And this has informed his active participation in various associations, including as president of University of Ibadan Medical Students Association, and recently two-time president of Association of Resident Doctors, FNPH Yaba, and committee chairman for the Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors. And amongst other things, I think I'll very much like to say that Still speaking to his love for volunteerism, is a fellow of the West African College of Physicians, Psychiatry, in bracket, and also volunteers as the regional coordinator in Lagos for Asido Foundation, a leading indigenous mental health non-governmental organization. Let me quickly go to Hamza Lawal. He's popularly called Hamzi, and he's the founder of Follow the Money, a homegrown pan-African grassroots data-driven initiative currently in 10 African countries. And is currently the chief executive of Connected Development, popularly known as CODE, an organization he founded and under his leadership won the One Africa 2016 award. I think that's quite massive. And to make a wrap, I'd like to talk to the fact that Amzad's Follow the Money, won United Nations SDG Action Award as Mobilizer 2019 in Bonn, Germany, the Council of Europe Democracy Innovation 2019 Award in Strasbourg, France, and the 2019 Future Award, Future Africa Award, I beg your pardon, on the advocacy category, Oxfam Novi in the Netherlands has recently recognized Hamzat as one of the many heroes fighting for a fair distribution of power, wealth, and equality worldwide. I think this is very massive. And I very quickly would like to go to Jamila Nawal, and she is a nutrition specialist, a content creator, and food entrepreneur. She's the host, and don't we all love Maggie Diaries? She's the host of the television cooking show, Maggie Diaries, where she showcases a fusion of Northern Nigerian inspired dishes. She is the deputy project lead and a facilitator at Nutrition Resource Center, African University of Science and Technology, Abuja, and the nutrition course facilitator at the Byron Institute. She's a speaker of many languages, and this quite fascinates me, including French, Arabic, Hausa, Ibera, English and a good, she has a good understanding of Yoruba, and I'm hoping she could throw one or two words in our advocacy today in Yoruba. <laughs> Damila is a firm advocate for the education of the girl child, and I should think that unites quite many of us on this call this afternoon. Not to leave myself out, I would very much like to talk about myself very briefly, but of course, while putting that on every protocol that has been duly observed, Melanie is an award-winning and consummate multimedia journalist with 
close to two decades of robust engagement on television and radio outlets for broadcasting. And as my MD would say, we are not a TV station. So for me to be to quickly say, very well, she's a multimedia journalist because that's what she does as the head of programs, punch videos, and punch newspapers. And she's an avid storyteller with the pairs for impact generation. To wrap this up, she is, she has received journalism training from the prestigious Nigeria Broadcast Academy, Nigeria, Graduate School of Media and Communications, Aga Khan University, Kenya. She was also trained at the Radio Netherlands Training Center on media campaign for social change and advocacy. She is passionate, I guess you can tell, she's a trusted voice in our vocation. And this brings me very quickly to our next uh, item on the agenda and very quickly we're going to shared experience session and this very well excites me so i would love to quickly go to panel discussion i beg your pardon and in going to panel discussion today i would like to quickly constitute of course the panel is already constituted but of course constituting it by introducing everyone on this call our panelists are our panelists are Mrs. Bimbo Oluyede. Panelists are Dr. Abiola Kyode Afolabi, Amzat B. Lawal, Benjamin Ondei, and Dr. Samuel Alade Jari. Uh, very quickly, you would wonder what we have to talk about. As I said earlier, we have the tone set by the keynote speak, uh, speech already given by Mrs. Bimbo Oluyede, and I'd like to introduce you to what the focus area is for each panelist. Right, so for Mrs. Bimbo Oluyede, the, the media's role in reporting gender-based violence and its impact, emphasizing the need for telling gender stories through a gender lens and the importance of balanced reportage. And also to Dr. Abiola Akiode Afolabi, I'd like to quickly talk you through the focus area, and that's the constitutional provisions protecting women's rights and seeking redress for victim survivors, the role of public-private partnerships in addressing attendance issues associated with GBV. For Hamza B. Lawal, his focus area is the causes or triggers of violence against women in Nigeria, the societal impacts, government responsibilities, and the role of the people in changing the narrative. And for Dr. Alade Jari Samuel, the mental health implications impact of gender-based violence and interventions for survivors. For Benjamin Undei, his focus area is the role of law enforcement agencies in curbing gender-based violence within the ambits of the Nigerian criminal justice system, highlighting police structures, platforms, and airplanes for pursuing such cases. Jamila Lawal, very well, as she is a survivor of GBV, will bravely share a story, a personal journey during the shared experience session. And of course, she contributes to the wholesome conversation that we are having today. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished members of this panel, please let me quickly bid you welcome as we go very quickly into the conversation of today. Very well, it would uh, be great to have everyone take, you know, the moments in just discussing what we have coming on as we discuss on this panel. I'd like to have contributions first, and then we can delve into questions, which case I'd like to encourage everyone on this call to please drop their questions in the chat box where I am able to pick them up and read them out to our panelists to discuss when it is time. And I will begin this time, I believe that I have had only women talk on this call. And that means I will, and I'm itchy to actually hear Benjamin Dane talk. And I'm thinking with him because indeed so much has been said. I could say I'm taking it to talking about the media responses to this, but I want to hear what the law has got to say. Um, so I'm hinted now that I have to first take it to the media angle. So indeed, um, apologies. I'd like to have Dr. Abiola Kiyode quickly speak to us. Let her open up on what she has for us on this panel. So good morning, Dr. Abiola Akiode Afolabi. Great to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. I mean, between Absolutely. about three back-to-back -back, uh, Zoom. Uh, they are taking place, so we can see I'm actually right in front of the GIZ in Ikoyi, just, you know, to make sure I find a place to talk. Okay, so I'll just go quickly to the 
uh, portion that I am uh, uh, I'm supposed to speak on. Thank and I you. want to Thank comment. You, and, and I'd like to say that, please, as you do so, kindly run us through it in five minutes. Thank you so much. Oh, great. That's better for me. <laughs> All right. So I, I um, first want to commend the guest speaker, uh, the keynote speaker, who had actually what we call in law cover the field uh, because she has actually spoken to uh, quite a number of issues. She's a great uh, big sister, a mentor, so I don't expect anything less. She's been involved in this way for, for a long time. Um, she had described the situation of violence and how uh, the situation is for Nigeria. So I'm going to be looking at uh, basically more around issues of, um, so we have laws. So why are the laws not working? And the law, of course, starts from the constitution, which is the grand norm uh, of the society. So we have the constitution and we have the federal laws, we have the state laws. And I want to say that in the last few uh, years or months, we have had over like 34 four states across the country have passed the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Law, meaning that uh, we have legal framework. So gone are the days when the complaint has been that uh, the laws are not there. So we have the legal framework, but there are also issues. So how are people using those legal frameworks? Are they effective? Are people even aware? And I think that's one of the things that Antibimbo mentioned about ignorance around the law, whether people are even aware, whether the law is actually uh, focusing uh, uh, whether the awareness of the law is being targeted at the you know, people who can use it, you know, to uh, uh, respond to the issues of the society. Nigeria is a signatory to a lot of international instruments, uh, which also put obligation on the state to be able to uh, prevent sexual and gender-based violence. And that's why this year, uh, the 16 days activism theme is talking about invest that the government should invest. And the investment is not necessarily in resources. It also means investment in also uh, the legal provision to be able to make it much more effective. For example, uh, there are a lot of things that can make you know, uh, gender-based violence uh, issue uh, to be properly addressed in Nigeria uh, beyond the law. Uh, so, we, as I, so I'm saying that we have the law, we have the constitution, because I have five minutes, we have the constitution, we have international instruments, and there is a whole lot of laws that can be cited from section 42 that talks about discrimination. There, there are laws that talk about human dignity, that talk about uh, uh, rights of uh, to personal liberty, privacy, and a whole lot of other all these issues. And all these issues affect the conversation and discussion around the issue of gender-based violence. So the question is, so why are the laws not working? What exactly are the issues that are not making the laws work? And do we need some kind of pirate public partnership, you know, to be able to make the law to work for us? Yes, uh, one of the reasons is because of the ignorance, you know, around the law. And of course, the inequity in the society, there is a power balance issue, you know. Uh, so there is also the question of accessibility to the court. So it depends on where the court is and it depends on where the violence is being is taking place. Even from Lagos between Ekpe and Ikeja, might actually be a long way to get to you know, a place of support. So um, so those are part of the things. The culture of silence is also there. The community acquiescence that will not also allow the law to work because the community wants to also cover, you know, where the law is supposed to take a step to be able to, you know, address some of the issues. The issue of victim blaming, you know, and also the, a, a, a whole lot of other issues. So then there's also the absence of reporting mechanism and sanctions for breaking the laws. So even when people are brought forward, so there are also no sanctions. There is already some kind of, uh, from the police, and it's good that I'm saying the unit is here, you know, from the police and some other uh, law enforcement agents, there are also some orders that you have to break. And so, and to a large extent, when the orders if you get to the police and they say there is no fuel, there is no this, there's no that, people get so frustrated and they want to, you know, uh, abandon the law and move forward. So some of those orders are orders that are allowing gender-based violence to continue. There's also biases and misrepresentation in media coverage. You see a lot of media coverage that are also not uh, positive uh, coverage, you know, for, for, or for gender-based violence. For example, you see media reporting a, a, an underage and also putting the name of the underage and a whole lot of other things, which could also, uh, add, uh, which could also cause more stigmatization and all, and all of that. There's inadequate or incorrect data to measure the prevalence and of course, there are also issues of lack of political will and a whole lot of other things. So there are laws in the country. So it's not really 
uh, that uh, we don't have enough laws, you know, that can address because the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act actually covered a whole lot of issues, including widowhood rights, including rape issues, and it described rape in a different manner from what we used to have in the uh, original law, which is the criminal and the penal code. So many that we have actually gone, you know, a long way forward, you know, in addressing and also using the law, you know, to address some of these issues. So, but the challenge is still that. So there, there are issues within the public sector in terms of understanding and also in the private sector. The private sector is, still, they are not saying that they need to invest in addressing sexual and gender-based violence or something that's very important. In most countries where you have philanthropy, what the philanthropists do is that they use their tax breaks to support the, uh, to support um, addressing um, community issues, sexual and gender-based violence, governance issues. We don't have a lot of practice of such, you know, in our area, uh, in Nigeria. And so, and that's an issue. So, and also there are also things happening in private sphere. For example, sexual harassment at workplace, which workplaces are not also taking steps in terms of, you know, addressing. So these are some of the issues, are some issues that are very uh, critical that are not making the law work appropriately for us. So there are also uh, a lot of uh, um, problems with the courts. There's a huge congestion. So if you don't have designated courts that are addressing sexual and gender-based violence, it might become a big problem. Then the government is also not putting the amounts where the money is. So the question of investing in resources, you know, in addressing sexual and gender-based violence also will not make the law work because if there's no shelter, sex centers are not in all the states, they're in very few places, you know. So even if there are challenges, we have to go. So the government must take responsibility. Private actors must take responsibility. The media must take responsibility. The public must take responsibility. So the, 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 the way to address sexual and gender-based violence, the what, the how, and the why, and the where is coming together as a collective force, you know, to address it, to use the law effectively, to also use uh, the community to, to, to go against sexual and gender-based violence, to also invest resources and do all other things. Thank you very much. I think that's what I can do in five minutes. He did a lot in five minutes, I must say. Thank you so much, Dr. Bielaki Adiapalabi. And indeed, so much that you said, you're landing on coming together, collaboration for me uh, was about the biggest thing you said here. I mean, our understanding of the laws and whatnot that we have, great, amazing. But then if we do not put hands together and equally begin at community levels, just as you have said, I understand what you do at community levels, and I hope we're able to get to how you're able to share with us how that can effectively curb, limit, reduce the instances of gender-based violence we have going on in our society. In Nigeria, thank you once again for that. I would equally like to reiterate that again, the time allotted to each panelist is five minutes. Dr. Abiolakio, like, they did try, but I would love that we all indeed try you know, harder, so we do not extend the whole call beyond what it should be extended. Uh, let me quickly say to everyone here present, and again, my way of welcoming everyone to this call, we have been talking gender-based violence, the what, the why, and way forward. Indeed, you can take a snapshot of yourself on this call, don't tell anyone. And when you do, please put it on social media, make a post about this webinar, Punch webinar series being uh, being hosted by Punch Media Foundation. And indeed, you can use the hashtags I'm about to call out, Punch Webinar Series, hashtag Punch Webinar Series, hashtag 16 Days of Activism, hashtag Punch Media Foundation, and hashtag Punch Newspapers. I think that does it for everyone. And that would make you an advocate too. That's simple. Okay, now I'd like to yield the floor over. I've introduced him earlier, but if there is nothing you remember, Please remember, follow the money. Indeed, it is time to hear Hamza Lawal speak to us. Now, as a panelist, he has five minutes and is able to yield to his focus area, talking to us today on the theme of this webinar. Good to have you, Hamza Lawal. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um for having me uh, just to commend the keynote speaker. I really enjoy listening to her. Um, first, I think that uh, we must accept the simple truth that uh, sexual and gender-based violence sadly has become a norm. 
it has become a norm that has been fueled, sadly also, by religion. Um, first, I want to you know state data because Connected Development did a study in three key cities, Lagos, Abuja, and Enugu State. And for us, we wanted to understand where exactly those uh, sexual and gender-based violence is prevalent. Interestingly, there are two key places that uh, raise the red flag. One is a motor park, and the second is a marketplace. Uh, and this is something we really find shocking, that most women are uh, being harassed in public places like motor park and, and the marketplace. And to people who have witnessed some of this harassment, they did not say it as harassment. And I think that uh, over the years, with awareness, there's some issues that a lot of people think is not sexual and gender-based harassment, uh, sexual and gender-based harassment, but now uh, people are getting to understand that uh, they are what it is. So I think that first, we, we need to start from our values. Um, before now, um, this was not a prevalent issue in our, in our country or in society. Because I grew up from a society where everyone provides protection, not only for their children or their wards, but also people within their community. But over the years, we've lost that value. Where now people who prey on others are people within the same community or household. So that's why when you see reports now, you see that people who molest uh, children or vulnerable people are people who actually reside and live within. Uh, that said uh, community. Uh, interestingly, we did a campaign in Northern Nigeria, and I think it's important to share this in this webinar. When we started it, it was galvanizing mass action against sexual and gender-based violence in Kano State. We got support from the Canadian High Commission. And what we did first was to identify 30 ladies, because over time, what I've learned is a lot of Yes, you need a he for she activist or he for she campaigners like the UN call us. But I also think that women need to start speaking up for themselves more and having teenagers and young girls. So what we did was select 30 young girls, transfer knowledge, with capacity and empowering, and getting them to meet with, you know, lawmakers at the state assembly and also, you know, the executive governor. Because I remember we created an avenue where they were engaging directly with the executive governor. And this was what also led to the governor signing the child protection law and also getting the state assembly uh, to pass the Violent Against Persons Prohibition Act, which we're now waiting for the executive governor to sign uh, into law. Uh, and one lesson we learned also running a radio program was the first four episodes was listeners attacking us, you know, and saying that, you know, we should not have this kind of conversation openly on radio. You know, this is sending the wrong message, you know, to various communities. And this is against, you know, traditional and religious norms to even have the conversation and have people share their story. But what we also learned is over time, people started accepting it because what we now did was work on clerics who can then put, you know, the spiritual or the scripture, the, the book, the, you know, the religious book and tie it to how... God communicates and say, you know, we must protect women, we must protect girls and, and boys who, who are vulnerable. Because what we found that is a lot of uh, cases of homeless kids being um, molested in Kano State, interestingly in the, in the, in the heart of um, Northern Nigeria. Uh, and this opened up, you know, a lot of, a lot of hidden uh, stories and, you know, having women come forward, also having people who's, in, within the family, they've experienced, uh, uh, you know, what we call it, you know, survivors, uh, and trying to get help. And this also led to the government setting up uh, SAC centers, which is um, where you can go report these cases, and these cases get escalated. And I think, as advocates, as uh, you know, activists, we mo we cannot take away the role of government, and in this case, we cannot take the role of law enforcement agents. Um, because for investigation to happen, you must be able to gather evidence and you must have the police, uh, you know, who represents the state to file a case uh, in court. So, wow, I'm doing my five minutes. So in wrapping up, I think first we need to have more uh, SAC centers across, you know, across the country. We need to be able to document 
this evidence in good time. And I think we need to do away with the culture of why didn't they speak early? Because I see a lot of people who defend people who have perpetrated this act, they will say, oh, you, why are you coming forward now? What happened two years ago? Why is it now? So I think we just first look, need to look at our morals around this and also get people to speak up. And when they speak up, we must protect them, you know, as people, as the state, and as humans. Thank you. Uh, we can't hear you. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me now? I think so. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you everyone. I really would like to say that Hamza Lawal really did keep it as brief as possible. And with a lot of points that I did jot down, I mean, first on that list was the fact or the realization that motor parks and marketplaces with the survey that the Connected Development did came up as you know top on the list of the spaces, the spots where sexual harassment, gender-based violence, takes place. And well, maybe not too much to be surprised about. I would remember in 2019, 18, I can't remember the name of this young lady in Nigeria who actually did trend over the fact that when you pass at Yaba, and I think virtually every lady may remember this, when you pass at Yaba, you are virtually being teased, being harassed by the boys who sell wares and whatnot. And it became a thing. And from that time until now, there's been a huge or sharp, you know, stop in that practice. And that's why I believe that when we continue to speak up, essentially it would be changes that we all would be proud of. Thank you so much for that. And very quickly, I'd like to yield the floor over to Mrs. Bimbo Uloyede, just before she takes on, is what I like to say, that we can all be advocates. And it doesn't take much, just as I said earlier. So while you make a post about what we have going on right here in this webinar series. And do not forget that this is put together by Punch Media Foundation. Please endeavor to use the hashtags that I will call just now. Okay, and these are hashtag Punch Webinar Series, hashtag 16 Days of Activism, hashtag Punch Media Foundation, and hashtag Punch Newspapers. We are counting on you to advocate along with us. Equally, I'd like to say that you can drop your questions on the chat box. We already have questions coming in from Facebook, Instagram, and we need you to keep them coming. On that note, I'd like to yield the floor over to you, Mrs. Bimbo Olojide. Thank you, your five minutes. Thank you very much. Yes, well, when we talk about the role of the media, um, it is is crucial, actually. The, the, the media's role is, is crucial. We're talking about um, a variety of, of things, uh, but I think we have to begin with agenda setting. You know, um, the media has the power to set the agenda positively or negatively. And uh, I think it is our sacred duty <clears throat> It's our, our sacred duty, excuse me, to, to move the nation forward. And moving the nation forward, to me, means talking about um, development issues, which, of course, encompasses uh, uh, issues of gender and uh, gender-based violence. I think media women have uh, almost a double responsibility, if you like. I think um, they need to make this issue um, a great area of, of focus because they know where the shoe pinches. They are women, after all, we are women. So uh, let me not separate myself from uh, uh, other media women. I, I am one too. Um, it, it, it's important for us to understand that, you know, we, we need to have a wholesome, um, wholesome families and um, uh, there are leadership challenges and there are, you know, issues of gender and health, et cetera, et cetera. So, it is for us to take the bull by the horns. Now, one of the ways that I think we can do this, and uh, this would be not just by women, I think this has to be 
um, a general approach. Uh, it's a suggestion anyway. We can use existing frameworks. So we have already heard, um, I have mentioned about the uh, convention um, on the elimination of discrimination against women. Dr. Uh, Abiola also mentioned it. CEDAW to me is a perfect opportunity to use an existing framework to write stories, to do investigations. Um, there are 16 articles in CEDAW and they cover a variety of topics. These include um, citizenship, co-partnership, um, uh, discrimination, safety, maternal mortality, all those things are all part of the 16 articles. And so uh, a, a journalist or a reporter does not have to go too far to find something that they can dig their teeth into. It's there, it's waiting on a platter of gold. All you need to do is just pick up a particular topic and, and run with it. Um, I think that as many platforms as possible should be, uh, should be engaged, especially uh, uh, creative ones. Um, we have seen people use TV and radio drama, uh, films, radio discussions, <clears throat> excuse me, jingles, TVCs, all those type of things. Um, some of them can be in English, some can be in uh, various uh, native languages, but it's important for us to embrace every type of creative input because you've got people who, who draw cartoons, you have photojournalists, you have photographers, all these people can actually make a serious input and impact um, when it comes to, to GBV. I think also that we can establish gender desks in newsrooms. Newspapers have gender, uh, new, sorry, uh, police stations have gender desks, not all of them, but uh, as far as I know, but I know that there are several gender desks in police stations. And I don't see why they cannot work in consonance with gender desks in newsrooms. Um, uh, the information is being uh, uh, reported uh, uh, to the gender desk in the police station. Why can't the reporter or the correspondent get such information and, and write? But then many a time when reporters present such stories, you find that editors don't think it's important. So this brings me to the uh, um, aspect of training. Editors need to be trained. Every time I see uh, letters and invitations going around to different uh, newsrooms for training, you will find reporters, you'll find correspondents, you'll find producers, you'll find anchors, presenters. Very, very rarely do you find editors. And so when these people fired up to come back to base and utilize their uh, uh, newly found skills, what happens? The editors don't understand. They can't fully appreciate. So I think editors need to be trained, in which case we can give um, GBV a human face. And then I think lastly, there was a time when uh, CNN adopted uh, human trafficking as an all encompassing issue that the entire channel, the entire network, all the network of correspondence keyed into. I don't see any reason why different media houses in Nigeria cannot adopt different aspects of gender-based violence. Let them pick the one that they think they can run with and run with it. So until we find ourselves in a situation where people take it seriously, where it is literally in our faces, we may not quite understand just how pervasive and how dangerous it is. Until it is somebody's daughter, until it is somebody's sister, or somebody's mother, and that somebody would be somebody of note. That's when I think people will begin to understand. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And we're praying it's not somebody's daughter, but that really isn't fair. Because for the numbers, the statistics that we have right now of SGBV, I need everyone to understand that this statistics is nothing real faces, real humans real people with actual lives that they live. So indeed, not to let this be the person you know, it's time to do something about it. And as media, we have huge responsibilities. It's how to say we shape conversations, 
were the ones who determined what's important, what's news, or what's not news. And for this part alone, I believe that we can do a lot with what actually gets done with the elimination of gender-based violence. Very quickly, I'd like to summarize all I heard us say with the aspect of journalists understanding the use of multi-platforms and being able to take on these platforms to disseminate this information. And I think key is the fact that editors need to also attend the trainings that their journalist colleagues attend. And lastly, the media houses should equally adopt at least an article of CEDAW, for example, or an aspect of GBV. I think this is really apt. that brings us close to actualizing what we have coming on. I need everyone to remember that this is the decade of change according to the United Nations. And I mean, more years before it is 2030, the work indeed is a lot. And that brings me to ushering in our next speaker in person of Benjamin Ndehi. And I'd personally say that I've been itching to hear you speak. And now that the time has come, may I please bid you welcome with a clap. So you have the floor and you have five minutes to please speak directly to your focus area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. And um, I must say that um, you pronounced my name well. Yes, kudos to you, you did. Thank you, and, uh, thank you. <laughs> and for the keynote speaker, she did justice to it. She has said everything that needs to be said. I wonder if it's still necessary for me to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Go ahead, okay. please. Okay, okay. Um, so quickly to my focus area, um, gender-based violence, um, the roles of um, law enforcement, particularly the police. Yes, basically, um, what has been said, uh, what we all know, provide avenues for reporting cases. Um, like um, somebody said earlier, we have this gender desk in virtually every police station. So th these are avenues for people to report cases. We also have the um, mandates to create awareness, and um, this has been made possible uh, largely with the help of NGOs. So many NGOs come to our aid in that regard. We also collaborate with other organizations. We are parent offenders, of course. That's um, paramount. We are parent offenders. Uh, of offenders. Um, we investigate these cases, prosecute uh, those that have been indicted. And we also have the duty to protect survivors. We need lots of resources for this. So we are not where we should be in that regard, but we are also um, trying our best to protect survivors. We take referral cases. Uh, so um, for gender cases, most times we, we get these cases through referrals. There are many NGOs out there, SAC centers that take on these cases and bring them to us. We also uh, collaborate with government agencies, the relevant government agencies to catalog offenders. The same way we catalog offenders here at our central criminal registry, government agencies like in Lagos, we have the Lagos State um, Domestic and Sexual Violence Agency. They have a catalog of offenders that fall within the sexual offenders, gender-based offenders. So I'm also supposed to talk about police structures. Yes, we have the gender desk. We have the first gender at the first headquarters. Um, they, they can be reached at first fciidgender.net. Mm, we also have the family support units, FSUs, family support units. We have the uh, gender office too at the command headquarters in Lagos, for example. They work in, in synergy with the Lagos State Domestic and Sexual Violence Agencies. And um, it, it's very commendable that we have so many NGOs, so many of them interested in SGBV. Um, they, 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 in fact, I would say that Gender-based violence has seen more support from NGOs than any other kind of crime in Lagos State. Um, so we have the Mirabel Center, we have the Cheche Yara Foundation, the Clean Foundation. We also have international um, agencies coming to our aid, USAID, UNODC, UNDP. We also have the National Human Rights Commission playing a very good um, role in this regard. And um, another agency, WARI, Women at Risk International Foundation, and these agencies have um, toll-free numbers that people can use to reach them. 
and they take these campaigns to where this is uh, most felt. For example, in Lagos, we receive uh, cases of gender-based violence more or mostly from Ecology. Yes, that's a fact, Ecology. And that's why we do more campaigns there for people to complain. And uh, we have our help points, particularly the most active now in Lagos State is the DSV, Domestic and Sexual Violence Against the Airplane. And it's so easy to remember 08000 And uh, we also have our own units too. So we work together with these airplanes. Wari 2 has a um, helpline. And um, most importantly, just before I round off, we have the Ministry of Women Affairs um, gender reporting site. It is reportsgbv.ng. Reportsgbv.ng. You'll be amazed at the resources you could get there. You could see statistics on gender-based violence, the ones that have been reported, the ones that have been investigated, the ones that have been concluded, um, the cases that are still in court. Um, so you, you see it state by state, and you'll see helplines there too, state by state. It can help. And lastly, before I go, you know, uh, a speaker talked about how difficult it is when you go to police stations uh, because they might tell you they don't have fuel to go arrest somebody. Well, while that might be true for many types of um, uh, complaints or cases, it's not very common when it comes to gender-based violence because we have so many NGOs coming to us to say, oh, we have the resources, we have the money, just tell us where this is happening and we're going to take it up. So you see the Mirabel Center say, Oh, we we'll, we'll run the medical test for free. We we'll go to the place and get the suspect and bring them. So it's been enjoying lots and lots of support. But the major problem we have, and uh, like I've been applying by um, the keynote speaker, we have so many problems. But most importantly, just a minute before I go, most importantly, when we arrest suspects and we take them to court, we do take them to court. And you discover that um, the parents of the survivor will insist that the survivor will not come to court. They don't want the survivor to come and recount her experiences. She will be traumatized and fresh. It will leave a scar on her bed um, in her memory. And they don't want all that. And by the time the magistrate compels the police to bring the survivor during the next hearing, you call the number, it's not going through. Only for you to discover they've changed the number. You go to their address, they've moved out. And they did not leave a forwarding address. And you dig for that, you discover that they even left southwest. They've left completely or they've gone out of the country. So most times we find we, we encounter these problems. People don't want to follow through. People say, see, I'll just leave it to God. I just wanted to go. And it's to make matters worse, elderly ones in society are the ones championing this. Elderly ones will say, oh, police, we don't want to do this case. We've settled it. It's a family matter. So this, these are things that are impeding progress made in this area. So I wish, uh, we're hoping and we keep telling people to follow through, report these cases. Let um, survivors testify so that um, the, 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 the criminals can be properly prosecuted and um, dealt with in accordance with the law. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benjamin, today for that. I really appreciate how you kept it so brief, but I do not know if anyone did what I was just about doing before I wrapped up, and that was checking reports, gbv.ng. I think everyone should get on there and see what we can have coming on from there. And equally, I picked out that if you needed to use the DSVRT legal stage, you could just Dial the number 08000 I think that's something so simple. We shouldn't forget that. But I think key amongst what he said was the focus on equal do, but I do know that we'll get to it shortly in the course of this call. So very quickly, let me say that the floor will be yielded over to the last panelist, and that is Dr. Samuel Aladejare. Indeed, we want to hear what it is that we can take home from the aspect of the mental health impact of GBV and how indeed to deal with it. You have the floor now, Dr. Samuel Aladejare. All right, thank you very much. 
Um, am I being heard? Yes, you are. Go ahead. Right. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I want to say that uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've I've also learned a lot. I've jotted down a number of things, especially when the uh first uh when when um um Sam Benjamin Dane was speaking, I've jotted the phone number because <laughs> there are things, there are times when we come across patients and Dr. Samuel, could you please could you please speak louder? Thank you. Okay, yeah. So there are times I said I've jotted down a couple of things uh, from uh, even uh, when Mr. Benjamin Day was speaking, uh, because there are some of those numbers, some of those links would really come in handy uh, for us as uh, clinicians, psychiatrists. As um, gender based violence is a major issue for us, it's a, a crucial issue. It's crucial because uh, it's, a, it's a long term thing. So when all the noise and everything is, is gone, and uh, so those people who are um who are survivors of this uh, condition are still with us they are with us for years and we are dealing with the consequences of some of the things that have been done in the past i want to say that the keynote speaker i can't thank her enough and uh, she has made my job very easy so i'll just go straight to my own aspect of uh, the talk indeed one of the earliest aspect one of the earliest experiences I had as a resident doctor in psychiatry was a man who brought, a man who was supposed to be, well, who appeared to be uh, highly religiously inclined, brought his wife uh, for assessment. And I was actually very impressed at the way he stood there and he was, uh, so he appeared so helpful in uh, getting, giving information and all that. And uh, I remember making my diagnosis and discussing with my seniors when I was true. And she said that, well, I don't think that you've gotten to the end of this matter because I think that this woman has a PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, but I didn't, I did, I didn't know why she said that. So after the man, uh what, during that after the interaction, the man had to go and do something else, and then the woman was alone. And then I started to ask one of the questions that she had told me about. And I asked her, and I started getting positive responses. And the next thing, the woman broke down in tears. So what was the issue? This woman was hearing voices and we couldn't speak out where the voice was coming, what, how it all started. The story I was given was that there was a robbery attack and the rest of the story wasn't adding up. And then she broke down in tears and told me that it wasn't a robbery attack, it was the husband. It was the husband who had been battering her, who had been beating her. And here was somebody that appeared very religiously inclined. And then that was when I understood why he was there all along why he didn't want to leave the room so that she wouldn't be able to say those things. So that is the, that's the um, magnitude of this issue for us. There is a very close relationship between gender-based violence and mental health because it's, uh, first of all, it worsens, uh, it can, it, it worsens ongoing mental health, mental illnesses. It also could initiate fresh illnesses where none even exist, uh, fresh illnesses, fresh symptoms where none even existed in the past. And uh, we also know that people, individuals who have suffered uh, one form of uh, gender-based violence in the past can also go ahead to become abusers later on in future. Uh, they could become perpetrators themselves. Uh, we also realize that the Number of the number of individuals with mental illnesses are overrepresented among perpetrators of um, gender-based violence. As a matter of fact, I did a study recently, and it was on personality disorders and its correlates. And one of the things I found that from that study was that virtually everyone who had experienced one form of gender-based violence in the past had. Uh, a personality disorder compared to those people who had not experienced any. So everyone who had experienced one had a personality disorder showing the uh, closeness between uh, those two conditions. So what are some of the implications of gender-based violence? One of it is uh, psychiatric uh, mental health implications. So there are behavioral issues that it brings up uh, such as early sexual activity, people could, it could uh, predispose the um, the survivors to promiscuity from an early age, teenage prostitution, and then uh, they could have relationship problems. And later on, they could also have 
um, conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder, which I mentioned, and incidentally, virtually every case of post-traumatic stress disorder I've seen is due to gender, one form of gender-based violence or the other, not even from war. And then there are mood problems such as depression and anxiety. People are taking to substance substances to cope. And uh, there are eating disorders, somatization disorders, where they begin to have different kinds of symptoms as a result of um, certain kind of non-specific symptoms that define um, cure sometimes. And there are those who have turned the anger on themselves uh, to start cutting themselves or to uh, start having uh, thoughts of killing themselves, which is suicide. So what are the uh, what solutions can be uh, preferred to this? One of the most important things is the passage of the Violence Against Persons Pro Prohibition Act of 2015, which has been passed by most states in Nigeria. But then there's the aspect of implementation. And I would say that a major aspect to that is that coordination, there has to be interagency coordination. Because like I said, uh, for instance, that woman, I couldn't offer much to her because she was going back to live with the same husband. If I decided to report, who do I report to? Where we shall live? when she goes back, when if she does not have to stay with that man. So there are all those questions. And I think that everybody working on this, we all need to stop working in silos and come together to have um, a dedicated channel where everyone understands how reporting should work. Uh, but then more, much more specialized interventions like therapy, we offer therapy to people, cognitive behavioral therapies, group therapies, supportive therapies, and then medications where and they are absolutely necessary. Thank you. Indeed, thank you so much, Dr. Samuel Aladejare. So much has been said, and I very much think that what stuck out for me was the idea that the study you did regarding the um, people who suffer from- disorders. Exactly, personality disorders. And it's interesting that it's actually uh, based or affected more the people who have suffered one way or the other gender-based violence. Indeed, this is bigger than we may think. Now, very quickly, we'll would return to moderated um, sessions of the panel in a bit, but we quickly need to take the shared experience session. And this is going to be taken by Jamila Lawal. Jamila Lawal is a public health professional and media personality. You are welcome. I understand that what you are doing for us is essentially to share your story. And I mean, for me, I would like to say where the culture of silence, you know, holds sway. Somebody would wonder how, first and foremost, you overcame that to be able to put yourself out there and share your story. You can have the floor now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for having me and it's a great opportunity to be here. Um, honestly, just like you said, um, you know, being in a society um, where um, there's a culture of silence and there's a lot of stigma um, attached to even speaking out on issues like this, um, it was it was a it was a battle that I needed to fight, you know, alone and by myself. And I'm just going to be sharing that um, quickly. I don't know how many minutes I have, five minutes or ten minutes, but I will share um, as much as I can. Um, I believe, so I believe me, you would, um, Jamila. Thank you. Please kindly help me utilize five minutes. I, I understand it's a lot to open up on, but please, five minutes. Thank you so much. Okay, I, I do not know that we still have Jamila on this call. I am here. It's I just okay, please. Just went last. All yes. right, go ahead, please. Thank you. Oh yes. So um, you know, coming from where I come from, just like you said, there's a culture of silence and you know, people gender-based violence, it comes, it's most multifactorial. And the most obvious ones are when it's physical, you know, or the question is, are you being hit? You know, uh, you know, is there any kind of um um, sexual violence that had been perpetrated against you. So for me, my experience was, um, it was psychological, it was an emotional one. And, you know, the thing is that I'm so glad that, you know, mental health is becoming, you know, very prominent. People are becoming more aware of um, how mental health um, can affect, you know, 
one's life and productivity and all of that. So for me, it was more of emotional, psychological um, trauma. And um, Mrs. Bimbo, you know, did great justice by just enumerating the different ways in which gender-based violence can occur. And so just being a young um, Northern lady and, you know, um, for us, marriage is really important. I think all over, you know, Nigeria, the African culture, um, marriage is, you know, it's cultural, it's also traditional, it's religious. And because marriage is such a cover, um, you know, and it's very intimate, it's also, you know, like a vessel in which gender-based violence or violence can be committed um, against women. And it could just go unnoticed because there's a lot of, uh, you know, culture and, you know, religious um, rules governing marriage. And so for me, then this uh, young lady, you know, got married and, you know, you have all of this, I'm um, just thinking it's just going to be fine. Um, but it didn't turn out that way. Um, through the few years um, being in the marriage, I went through um, emotional abuse, verbal abuse, um, which became very traumatic for me. I had a very traumatic um, experience. And within this period, you know, I had a son. And not only was I, you know, um, you know, like men became kind of mentally unstable because of the kind of abuse that I was. So um, just to note that I was not physically abused. I was mentally like, emotionally abused but then the physical abuse started on my son and I knew that if the longer I stay here what was being done to my son was going to be done to me as well it was just a matter of time so the I, I began to think like the longer I stay here and I'm realizing this is dawning on me what he's doing to this child is what is is what is awaiting me and I knew that I didn't want to continue in that way I didn't want my child to be raised in a home like that, you know, I mean, for me, my parents did better and I wanted better for him. Now, coming to the psychological part of it all, I was traumatized. There was, you know, verbal abuse. There was emotional abuse. There was, you know, just false allegations of, you know, things that I was not even aware of just to find a way to break me. Because at that time, I used to think, what did I do to deserve all of these things? I don't know what is, where this is coming from. And when I go back uh, you know, just like, uh, you know, the previous speakers have mentioned, um, family is also kind of, you know, I don't know, do they support this or do they back it? The society is not ready for, you know, for women to even speak up. I go back to this family and I'm saying, this is what is happening. And they say, oh, it's normal. You know, I mean, you're a woman. That's what marriage is. You, you, you have to take it. In fact, accept that it's true. Whatever he says, you do it, just say, yes, it's true. And just so that you can, you know, save the marriage and make it work. And then I go back, but I realize that, you know, I'm a human being. The thing is, if you cannot express the sense physically and nobody's able to understand what you're going through, it begins to cause damage to you emotionally and in everything that you do. And so mental health is so important because um, you, you are not able to do the things that you used to do. It affects you in every way. It affects your productivity. I couldn't think clearly anymore. Before, you know, getting married, I had all of these dreams and all of this um, vision and they were not coming to light because... I was in a place that I was stifled and I couldn't breathe. And I was, you know, I was going through a lot. I was, I was anxious. So I developed anxiety disorder. I was, I could not sleep. I could not eat all that um, the doctors mentioned earlier. I couldn't eat. I had lost weight completely. I was a shadow of myself. And now there was a fear of this person who was supposed to be your protector, your husband, and you, you know, you were married to him. You know, I became so fearful, so fearful that, even sleeping at night became became very hard because I thought maybe he could strangle me. And there was a fear also of, for my son. I thought maybe one day I would just wake up and see that he has, you know, strangled him because it wasn't only affecting me, it was also affecting the young child who was just a year plus. And he started hitting the child at every opportunity. And for a child who was just barely one year old and a couple of months, I remember, I think one of the things that actually really broke me, and whenever I think about it now, it brings, you know, it, it's very hurtful. He hit this child so badly that the child started throwing up and he walked out. He hit the child so hard because he knew I'm going to get her. Let me do this. And my troubles began when I decided to tell his family, you know, it's like, oh, you exposed me. Okay, you're going to get the brunt of it. And so he hit this child so bad in the presence of his mother that this one-year-old toddler started throwing up and he walked out, you know, and I was like, I'm not going to do this. I don't, I will not be able to do this anymore. 
I went home, you know, told my parents and, you know, just like Mr. Lowell said, coming out, especially in the, you know, he, he's done some work um, in the North. I'm um, speaking about stuff like this, you know, there's religious rulings, there's culture, even more of culture than even religion. And, you know, there's also, when you talk about, oh, there's, there's, there are laws that could actually protect you, but then there's, the information is not, it's, it's filtered that women don't even know that there are these laws. You know, after the end of my marriage, people kept asking me, how did you do it? And I'm like, but these laws are there. These laws are there. You just have to find it. But the thing is, how, how do you, you know, in when the patriarchy is there, um, you're saying this, and then there are conflicting views, and then there's wrapping culture and religion together, and then women don't even know which way to go. You know, there's a lot of shame, you know, um, attached to it. Um, <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I also understand that, you know, the, I mean, marriage can be beautiful, you know, and it's the, it's the foundation of, you know, a healthy, progressive society. But then in the same, um, you know, um, situation, you can create more harm than good. So imagine I'm um, raising a child who has been hit, whose mother is eventually being hit and verbally and emotionally abused. It's going to grow up thinking that it's fine to do the same thing. I don't want to raise a child like that. I don't want to be an unhappy person. I wasn't just, you know, sent to the world to just be emotionally abused in the marriage and to just have a child. I believed that there was much more to me being a human being than just that. Okay, so I didn't want that Absolutely. to define me. I didn't want that yes. to define me. And I'm just going to be grateful that because I keep thinking sometimes if I didn't have the education that my parents gave me, what would I have done? Uh, and I think this is a, it's a great thing that, you know, we're doing and the Punch Media uh, Foundation is doing, you know, raising awareness because they need to be, people need to be more aware, women need to be more aware that, you know, you can live and you can survive, you know, in spite of all of this. And so for that reason, I kept, I mean, my faith kept me. I can't say it was easy. It's never easy. Nobody said, you know, life was going to be easy anyway, but I knew that I wanted more and my faith kept me through. And I just kept praying, Ya Allah, you know, this is, you know, what you, I mean, I, this has wow. happened. Thank um, you. Thank you so much, Jamila. I mean, I see the passion with which you speak. I mean, I could imagine if we said Jamila could talk for one hour and you would have a lot to share on your story. Indeed, the story of one woman, as I love to say, is the story of all women. In a lot of ways, you could see some intersectionality as a woman in what you are sharing. And you ask yourself sometimes how you had to uh, let go of certain things. And sometimes how you are, you have had to fight against certain other things and how you equally had to pay for it. Thank you, Jamila, for speaking up. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I wish I could Thank say you. more. <laughs> I know, I know, trust me, trust me. And I really was looking at an avenue, but I understand that Punch Media Foundation does this punch webinar series from time to time. And we look forward to being able to hear more from you when we do host and all that. Thank you very much, Jamila. And indeed, as you're still a part of this call, a lot is still ongoing, and I know that there will be questions for you. So please let's keep it coming. Now, very okay, please. So very quickly, I'd like to say that I announced that we were going to the moderated session or moderated part of the uh, panel discussion earlier. But to do that, I'd like to very quickly alert our panelists, please, please be ready. But very quickly, I'd like to equally take polls and some questions, just so when we come back to the moderated panel session, everything can happen just in a jiffy. So the polls are now being rolled, and I need you to please participate in this right now. It doesn't take so much time. Quickly participate in this poll, and let's get this going. All right, are you on there? Participate in this poll, and let's get this going. I currently have questions already being sent in. Okay, um, so for the questions that we have on Facebook and Instagram, I will be reading them shortly. Do send in your questions as, as well if you are watching on any social media platform. And if you are watching with us on the call on Zoom, do send in your question on the chat and it would be treated, trust me. We can't not wait to actually answer these questions. That's how we know that you've learned a thing or two from everything we're doing. Okay, now, while that's noted, I think that's ongoing. Go in. Okay, the poll is ongoing. I hope you're answering yours. Keep it real. Keep it 
if a real, okay, and that's it. So while that's still ongoing, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say thank you for your time up until now. And I call it, want you to know that we are aware of how fast our time is going. And while the poll is being taken, I'd like to actually take questions. So a number of them I did say came on Facebook and I'll be reading them out. And this actually for our panelists to take notes as we come back to the moderated session of the panel discussion, we would be taking these questions. So in a situation where parking is the last option, does it still count as a form of GBV? So I'm trying to put this question in better perspective because I do not think um, from... I do not know if you can back. Okay, please, can you hear me now? All right, thank you. I apologize for the break in transmission. It was a little glitch right here. So now that that's sorted, very quickly, I was on the questions the other time, and I did read a question that we got from one of my um, attendee. The question was that in a situation where hawking is the last option, does it still count as a form of GPV? I think the person is speaking to what Hansat Lawal spoke on when he spoke about their survey reports that motor parks and marketplaces are one of the places that rank highest on the places where GBV uh, take place. So I am thinking that in that regard, if this person only has the option of working to make money, what should the person do to still keep safe in spite of the fact that GBV harassment or whatnot actually holds sway in the spaces. Okay, quickly, I'd like to read another question. And this is, can we predict the year gender abuses will stop in Nigeria? If it's a thing of the mindset, what role is religion playing with eradicating, with eradicating the stains that the abuse, that abuse the freedom of others, forced marriage, modern slavery, victimization, equality, and social justice. If we don't have a target here yeah, that will make it uncivilized, that will make it an uncivilized behavior, then the propaganda will be an infinite commitment. This came from Facebook. Indeed, this will be answered. And very quickly, I understand that the polls have now been taken and that is over. While that's done, we're in the question and answer session. And very quickly, may I know if we have questions in the chat right here. Okay, I'm on there to check. In the absence of that, I'll very quickly like to go back to the moderated part of our panel discussion. And on that note, I'd like to again, recognize and acknowledge the presence of our panelists. And these are Mrs. Bimbo Oluyede, Dr. Abiola Akeodia Folabi, which by now I think is not a part of this call. I'd like to check again to be sure. However, we have Hamza Lawal, we have Benjamin Hundei, and Dr. Samuel Aladejari. Okay, now quickly we would go to give some more context to everything that has been said so much 
has been said, to be honest, and sincerely I would that there was more time so we could engage this uh, a lot more robustly. But for the time that we have, as Yoruba people would say, the sun is just enough to dry the clothes that we have put out there. And so for that time, let me begin by asking, and I'll very quickly like for the two questions I've asked to be answered first by Mrs. Bimbo Oluyede, and I would equally like uh, Hamzat Lawal to answer, seeing as I think the first question came off the back of the presentation you gave. So first to Mrs. Bimbo Oluyede, and then to Hamzat Lawal. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm ready to answer the question, but um, I am not sure exactly what that, what that question was. Could you please repeat it? So again, the question was essentially, and this, I guess, was the last question that I read now. It's a lot, and the person wanted to know if we can predict the year gender abuse will stop in Nigeria. Very pointed question. And if it's just a thing of the mindset, the role of religion in eradicating this, and if the abuse of freedom of others, post marriage, modern slavery, victimization, equality, and social justice would come to an end, amongst other things. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. Let me. Uh, yes. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for that question. Predicting? No way. We're not uh, soothsayers, so we're not. It's not possible for us to predict when uh, when gender-based violence will come to an end. What we can do is to say um, we can set a date that we would like to work towards, or maybe I should say we set a date for when we would like to see an end to gender-based violence and work backwards from that date so that we can have a clear picture of what we need to do with timelines, uh, deadlines, et cetera, et cetera, allocating responsibilities to different groups of people so that we know what all of us have to do to ensure that that particular date that we set becomes as real as possible. But um, perfectly, to be perfectly honest, we, can't, uh, we cannot say that this is the date when, when it will end. And for the, all the other aspects that were mentioned in that question. I think um, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the mindset that we have. I think a lot of it has to do with our world view. Well, you know, people keep on talking about, um, including me, I've mentioned it this morning, uh, we talk about culture, we talk about history, we talk about all these things, but all these are um, are things of the past. So the question now is, if culture is about people and the lives and uh, um, uh, the thinking and the, the lifestyle of people, um, if it is dynamic, which is what culture is, then for how long are we going to keep on holding on to these um, uh, has been uh, been there and done that ideas uh, that it is culture and tradition. What is it, who is to say that culture and tradition cannot change? If people decide that we are not doing this, this way, this is now the new way we're going to do it, then what happens? It becomes a new culture. It becomes a new tradition. It is because the will is not there, because some of these things serve certain groups of people. And I'm not saying that it is just serving men. It is serving specific groups of people who are, uh, who are milking the, 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 the situation, milking the opportunities, opportunities, exploiting the situations and taking advantage. It's as simple as that, as far as I'm concerned. So thank you so much. Collective will that is required to change the mindset. When the mindset changes, everything else afterwards also will change. Thank you. Most Thank you very much. I, we're indeed grateful for that response. And indeed, the floor is now yielded over to Hamza Lawal, who answers the second question. And 
just to take it again, the person was essentially asking about the whole Hawking thing, which I think speaks to the safety or not of the market space when it comes to GBVs. So what's, what's the question again? So the question was, which again, it wasn't properly put together, but my understanding is if a question is asked like in a situation where Hawking is the last option, does it count as a form of GBV? That's what the person had asked. But I'm thinking this person, yes, go ahead, please. He's speaking to okay, so the survey. I'll share the, yeah, I'll share the, um, one of our success stories in Adamawa State. So in Adamawa State, uh, the two local government that early child marriage uh, is, is, is prevalent and numbers of out-of-school children due to poverty. And what we found that was a lot of families and households were using their daughters for transaction to collect bride price so that they can, you know, they can fed for themselves. So just working with the Emirate Council, so the Adamawa State Emirate Council, a law was passed or a pronouncement was made. So because for in northern Nigeria, when the EMEA made a, makes a pronouncement, it becomes law. It was two. One, that every child, every girl child must go to school. And then two, no child under 18 should be married out for any reason. Uh, so just to say that, uh, you know, with that alone, it took away, you know, child on the streets who were hawking and also put an end to, uh, you know, making girls bride who are underage. So I believe that provides a context for, uh, for the question that was asked. Indeed, indeed, Amzad, thank you so much for providing that response. And, you know, we can go on to engage this and equally open the floor for more members of the panel to respond, especially to these two questions that have been asked, but for want of time. And the poll that we took off a couple of minutes ago, the result is now ready. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please, with your gazes on your screen, the results. Now, very quickly, I'll run through this. Do you know what gender-based violence is? And we have 98% yeses. And that's huge. I would love to clap, even John, right? And well, in statistics, we could say 2% is so insignificant, but indeed, we encourage those who said no to actually acquaint themselves with the subject matter of gender-based violence. Now, did you learn what you know about GBV through the media and 86% said yes. Wow, this is amazing. And indeed, we are 14% saying no. I mean, the media still has to take up spaces to educate, inform, and do what is, is expected. Now, which media platform did you learn it from? 62% said newspapers, you, you, and I'm thinking, punch newspapers top on that list, <laughs> right? And well, television, 51%, radio, 38%, blogs, 16% social media, 65% online news platforms, 51%. That this speaks to why we have to have multiplicity of platforms. Indeed, Mrs. Bimbo Louis spoke to this and we see that right here in data. Thank you, everyone. And that would be the result from the poll that we took right on this call. And while we're making a wrap very quickly, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we're still in the moderated session of the panel discussion and time would not permit that I asked the questions that I had prepared ahead to ask all of the panelists. But I would love to yield the floor over to everyone and I would right now begin with Benjamin Udeni and I would reel out would follow after him to quickly take 30 seconds each to give me their wrap of thoughts about the subject matter, gender-based violence in Nigeria, the what, why, and way forward. Thank you very much. Okay, very quickly, while Benjamin Undey is preparing to do that, can I quickly have, well, I'll start with Dr. Samuel Aladejari. Doctor, can I have you give your wrap of thoughts around the entire discourse today? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. In I 30 will... seconds. 
Impactful. Yes, impactful. So I uh, will speak on the thing I left be uh, the point I left. Um, that is about men. I think uh, we only usually remember men when it's time to talk about the victims. Uh, when it's time to talk about perpetrators, we forget them when it comes to being victims. So we shouldn't forget that they are also victims, especially from a young age. And uh, those who are abused uh, could go on later on to become abusers. And of course. For now, they occupy the uh, political positions to make things happen. So maybe if that aspect is also emphasized in the entire discussion, it will gather more attention at the political level and we can have a solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Samuel. I'd like to know if Benjamin Day can take the floor now. I understand he's still on this call. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, could you come um, again with a question? All right, thank you. So I accept for want of time, I could have reeled out lots of questions that I prepared. And however, I'd like for you to take 30 seconds to quickly give me your wrap up thoughts around the entire discourse today so we can make it up. Okay, thank you very much. I think we need to break cultural barriers. We need to break cultural barriers. And we need to move from the norm where elderly ones in the family, these are things we've seen mostly, come and say, oh, it's a family issue, we don't want to pursue the case, and we will not allow the, the survivor come forward to um, testify. So that's one major thing we need to break. If we can break that in Lagos here, at least, um, most of our cases will result in proper convictions and to serve as deterrence to others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin. And I would very quickly go to Mrs. Quickly, in 30 seconds, give me your up of thoughts. All right, thank you so much. Um, I think, um, let me take up from where uh, Mr. Hundei left off. Um, I would say that if we can, especially the media, if we can give GBV more of a human face that we can relate to, that is, if we can tell more individual stories, um, I believe that that would uh, help to become um, a deterrent. It would uh, give out more, more information, just like the punch did. Yeah, sometime in October, there was a story about a doctor who had uh, defiled his niece and uh, uh, the doctor was um, uh, arraigned. He was uh, prosecuted, charged and uh, sentenced. I think we need to have more such uh, sentencing so that it is a deterrent. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And that very quickly moves me to Anzad Lawal. Please give me your rapid thoughts in just 30 seconds. Thank you. Well, thank you for the great conversation. I think it's possible to end sexual and gender-based violence and the responsibility lies on and every one of us, if we play our roles individually and then collectively, we can roll back and end sexual and gender based violence in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, last but not the least, Jamila Lawal, I really would like to have the wrap of thoughts as we put this down in. Thank you very much. I think um, it's, I mean, we have to move from talking to actually working. And the media has a huge role to play. Um, ev almost everyone now has access. There's different ways in which this information can be passed because people need to be empowered with information so that it can make you know informed decisions. And I think you know media is really a huge, huge tool that can be used so women know that it's okay to come out and talk about these things. And so that it doesn't become they're no longer stigmatized. There's no stigmatization attached to um, violence committed against them. So the more they're getting more they're aware, the more these things are put out there in the in, you know in people's faces that it's it's okay and you can report. Like in the north, we don't have. I mean, just unlike how you have um, all of those agencies in Lagos, we don't really have. And this radio program that you know Hamza is part of, you know, I've listened to it before, but it's not enough. We need to be able to have safe spaces where you know girls and women can go to and feel safe to speak about it. But I think media has a lot a role to play. TVs, kids, dramas, um, all of that can be used as a tool to say, you know, this Thank is you. wrong to you, and you can report these cases. Thank you so much. I hope I was able to do, say something. That you did justice, Jamila. You did justice, and I should commend you how you told your story in such a short period when I yielded the floor over to you earlier for your shared experience session. I may I say that we will be reaching out to you uh, from Punch and that would uh, 
that would entail all of our platforms so that we can have a multi-platform interview with you and we're able to uh, prepare or project the story beyond what we, have, we, we had heard on this call today. Thank you so much for the boldness, the bravery to actually come out to share your story. Thank you. Indeed, speaking of safe spaces, I'd like to give the full vote of thanks uh, from that and to say that safe spaces are important and all of us would be responsibility would be responsible i beg your pardon in creating these safe spaces around us do not forget that the theme for the 16 days of activism since last year by the united nations has been unite and for this year it's unite to prevent violence unite invest to prevent violence against women and girls what better way to wrap up today's call than to say to you, thank you for joining us. Thank you for spending your two hours with us, for investing it in this course that we are so passionate and we're working tirelessly at the Punch Media Foundation and Punch Newspapers and Punch Nigeria Limited as a whole to invest our time, resource, and even personnel to ensure that we bring an end to gender-based violence as well as other violence that we have across our society. Indeed, I'd love, love to say a big thank you to the entire members of Staff Punch, Nigeria Limited, and equally to say a big thank you to uh, the members of the Board of Trustees that have joined us today. I equally would like to say a big thank you, starting with the MD, Punch Newspapers, Mr. Adeyaye Joseph, as well as Mrs. Angela Emua. I'd like to say a big thank you to the entire Punch Media Foundation team as led as by Mrs. Rebecca Arure, Head Programs and Research. That will be all from us, and we look forward to having you on our next Punch webinar series. My name is Melanie Ishola. Goodbye.